Good evening, and welcome to, to Money Matters. My name is Kim Hatza, and I'm a business attorney and partner at Millcrest Law in Radnor, Pennsylvania. I focus my practice in the areas of technology, life sciences, and healthcare. Tonight, we're continuing our series on life sciences leaders in the Delaware Valley. Before I get started, I want to remind our viewers that from time to time, financial issues relating to life sciences companies or matters may be discussed on the show. These discussions are not financial advice and, and should not be viewed as such. Moreover, since the show is pre-recorded and shown at a later time, the information may no longer be current. You should always check with your financial advisor before entering into any financial transaction. I'm happy to have with me as my co-host this evening, Charlie Huntington. Charlie's the head of uh, public relations for Life Sciences PA. Life Sciences PA is the voice of advancement for the life sciences industry in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Charlie, thanks for co-hosting. You're welcome, Kevin. Nice to be here. Um, Charlie, we, ju we just got through a busy summer for Life Sciences PA, and now uh, there's a, an awful lot that's on the agenda for the fall as well. I was wondering if you would just take a minute and share with our viewers uh, something about those events. Sure. So uh, Life Sciences Future, as you know, happened in September. It was a smash success, 700 people from many different states and many different countries attended. The highlight for me was hearing Montel Williams, who you know uh, has MS. He is in town, uh, was in town then, with a new medical device, which may actually turn some people's MS symptoms around. It was extraordinary. So he had, he had brought somebody to town uh, who, like him, their health had been improved because of this device, and it was, it was remarkable. Um, one event I would like to highlight in the future is December 6th, uh, the association is having its annual holiday mixer, and that's going to be out at its headquarters at 650 Swedesford Road in Berwyn. So uh, you can look at the website, which is lifesciencespluralpa.org, if you're interested in more information. I just, I think I received an email this morning about the supply chain summit that's coming up too in the latter part of October. Right. There are lots, lots of events on the horizon and people who are connected to not only life science, but biotech, pharma, med devices, healthcare, IT, clinical research organizations are welcome and encouraged to attend. That's wonderful. Thank you. Well, we have a great show this evening, uh, but I do want to remind our viewers that if you have a question that you would like us to answer on a future show, this is how you do it. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matterstv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our host and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, T-V dot com. It's now with great ple pleasure that I introduce our special guest this evening, Dr. Dahlia El-Sharif. Um, she's the founder and CEO of Dalen Digital, LLC an early stage company with a mobile platform, I Take Control, for clinical evidence-based research and learning programs. She has more than 20 years of experience as a management consultant in the pharmaceutical, medical device, and healthcare industries. That experience includes significant stints with both PA Consulting and IBM. Later, she moved to Shire, where she led the strategic planning and portfolio management function for Shire's specialty pharma division. In that role, she drove the establishment of Shire's big data and advanced analytics capability. She also established a roadmap for strategic and innovative development of mobile and gaming solutions. More recently, in an entrepreneurial turn, she helped establish Pixa Solutions, a, consult a consulting company focusing on services that drive cross-functional research and development excellence. She earned a BS in biology with a minor in psychology from Temple University and she later earned her PhD in biomedical science from Drexel University. Dahlia, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, what first attracted you to a career in the life sciences? So I've always had a passion for life sciences. Um, I grew up with a, a surgeon, my mother was a surgeon, and I've always known that this is an area that I wanted to be in. 
Uh, so having gone into uh, uh, biology as an undergrad and then later on a PhD in biomed um, is, is kind of was a, was a passion of mine. When we first met, um, you mentioned that you know, by starting your career with, with big consulting, management consulting companies like PA Consulting and IBM, mm -hmm. um, was, it turned out to be a great thing for you because it gave you such an overview of the yeah. of the industry and how everything worked. Could you expand on that a little bit yeah. for our viewers? Yeah, absolutely. And I was I was very fortunate, I think, in my career and to how I've come to where I've come to um, in terms of the, the experience that I had with management consulting. So right out of my uh, graduate work in um, Drexel, my PhD, you could go in many, many different ways. And um, I happened to stumble, I would say stumble into management consulting uh, because uh, I met a partner in one of the conferences there um, who introduced me to that world. Um, the management consulting environment allows you to work in multiple different organizations across multiple different functions. So it really gives you that experience across the board as opposed to just having a narrow um, experience in like say regulatory affairs or clinical or medical. I was very fortunate to be able to work across all of the R&D functions, all of the commercial functions, as well as the corporate functions and get my hands into the finance and some of the legal aspects as well. How, how would you say that your experience as in, in the management consulting world and then at Shire in a pharmaceutical company helped prepare you for your role as a CEO of a startup company with a very exciting mobile platform? Yeah. So it's a, it's a g great question. Um, when you have a startup, it's not just about a product. And I think a lot of people look at, they say, I've got this great product and I want to start this company and I'm going to sell this product. There's a lot that goes on around that. And having the experience that I had, and again, very fortunate experience that I've had to have the technical background with the PhD and then the management consulting, you get all of the different aspects. So when you look at, um, there's the, corporate functions, I would say the corporate functions. So if you look at legal, just legal alone, there's the HR employment, there's the IP aspects, there's the corporate aspects, and there's the accounting, there's the financial, the, um, the um, just the, the being able to financially project where the company's going, the growth strategies, et cetera. I would say that my experience in both the consulting and the uh, experience that I had at Shire allowed me to get that holistic view to be able to build the foundation of the company mm -hmm. um, and think of all of those pieces. The portfolio management, for example, you have to plan ahead. You have to know what decisions to make to go forward with on your product um, that's going to actually generate a return to keep you going. So that has allowed me to, to put in all of those components for the business. Um, Besides the corporate functions, there's also the product design and being able to strategically design a product that is going to be competitive in the marketplace. So you can have a great product. It doesn't mean it's going to succeed. You can have a great product that passes the FDA. It doesn't mean it's going to succeed. You have to have the sales and marketing components as well. You have to be able to look at the commercial side um, as well when you're designing that product. And so when we look at our product um, roadmap and what we're going to be putting in first, second, and third and how we go forward, um, that experience has definitely helped with that. But it's not just about me as a CEO, it's about the, the team that we have. Um, putting in place a solid team, you don't know it all. And I, I've seen people who've in the past said, I'm, I'm gonna start this company, I've got this great product, and it's a one-man show with a, with a technology that may or may not be great, but it's not, um, it's not gonna make it. So the team that you have around you, I don't know it all, I certainly don't know it all. <laughs> So I've, I've been able to build a solid team, I think, that, that can help us progress forward in the way that we need to in a very strategic and positive manner. Um, our executive vice president, Chris Jones, has over 20 years of experience in the digital healthcare space. He's helped various companies um, uh, put in place their own plans in the digital uh, um, area, as well as um, advances in their own technologies. So very happy to have him with us, and I know he's going to be a key contributor to the business as we move forward. Um, we also have a very solid technology group as well. Um, what would you say has been the most challenging aspect of the transition from the consulting world and the, and the pharmaceutical world to being the CEO of a startup company? Sure. Um, it's, it's funny because you look at a lot of people who are very successful in the corporate world and you've got that padding around you. You've got the, the infrastructure around you to, you know, it's okay if you slip up or if you make a mistake or, or anything else that happens because there's a whole 
infrastructure that's there to support the one the one offs. In a startup, it's not like that. In a startup, it's all it's it's very intense. It's nonstop. It's a constant go. And if uh, if you don't have it all put together, you will collapse. And I've seen companies, you know, great ideas come forward in a startup but never make it. So one of the one of the biggest things that we looked at, and one of the challenges that we had, is how do we build a foundation and a roadmap that'll actually get us off the ground and out to market? Um, we did a round of friend and friends and family to get a little bit of of the finances to get us going. And then we said, well, how do we keep ourselves moving from beyond that point? So the biggest part is the financial aspect and putting in place a plan that will allow us to continue to be successful and self-sustaining. We're not going to run out of money. We're not going to come up with this great thing that, that is going to collapse or doesn't have an audience that we're going to be able to market it to. Um, so those are, so those are th some of the things that we looked at. It's just kind of the infrastructure, building a solid foundation to get off the ground. Yeah. Delia, can you tell us about your current company as well as the I Take Control uh, mobile platform? Sure. So um, our the I Take Control platform is really three core applications that we look at: um, the real world evidence, and then we've got the clinical trial management, and then training and compliance, which is a little different than the other two. Okay. I'll talk about each of them just a little bit. Um, the real world evidence is it's it's really where the industry's headed: healthcare, mm -hmm. pharma, life sciences. We gather data every day. We we generate data every day, and where does that data go? So real world evidence is really about taking that real data every day from everyday use and doing something with it. Um, there's a couple of things about real world evidence that we look at. Um, patient centricity and where the industry is heading with pa patient centricity. Patients are at the center now. They're making the calls about their own disease and their health care. And we need to look at that as we consider the different innovations moving forward. Okay. Yes, the key players of provider and payer and even pharma are still very much critical stakeholders in the ecosystem, but putting that patient in the center is what's changing everything. And then looking at that data and saying, what are we gonna do with that data and harvesting that data is the next level. So real world evidence is really, that the application of I take control for real world evidence is really about that. Providing an application to the patient that they can have in the palm of their hands, patient centric, all about them, getting them engaged, giving them something back about their their disease in mm -hmm. their hands, and then um, harvesting that data to find insights and help the, the disease population accordingly. Um, the second aspect is the clinical trial management. So again, that's changing in this in the, in the environment. It used to be very, you know, very much, and it still is, and uh, is shifting. the The patient has to go to the the site. Um, for the visits, for the treatments, et cetera. And it's just doesn't, you know, think of a population that's used to doing everything on their phone, and now right. you're saying go to this site frequently, how inconvenient, and log into this system and enter your data in this archaic, you know, system. It doesn't work like that for a lot of people in their day 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 to day, right? They're not used right. to that. So it's really changing that and, and kind of riding that wave and saying we're gonna be part of that evolution and giving for clinical trial management, giving them a, to a tool and a solution that patients can enter their data right from home or their caregivers can do it from the home. Now, it doesn't work for everything. It doesn't work for all the, the diseases and the different types of data we need to collect, mm -hmm. but for a good portion of it, it could, it could work. Um, and the other aspect as well of clinical trial management is really around innovation, and this is where a core component of this is really, you know, we, we need to think of it, and I take control is tr trying to really find the pockets where we can innovate to help clinical trials in a different way. Think of um, muscular disorders, for example. If you have a muscular disorder, there's a lot of video assessments that you can take that can show you, you know, how the patient is progressing. We don't capture those today, and we can, we can though, and mm -hmm. we can do it in a mobile application. You can't capture it off your phone because it's a controlled clinical trial, right. but if you build in the right um, data flows and the right audit trails and take into account all of that, you can definitely do it in a mobile application. So that's kind of what I take control is working on in the clinical trial management space. 
And then the third one is um, training and, and compliance. And that just kind of happens to be because we have a training module. We have several features and several modules in iTake Control as a platform. One of them is learning and training mm -hmm. and using that to um, for various applications. So you can um, teach someone about their disease. So we use this in our, we have an, uh, an app for binge eating disorder. And we use the training module to, or the learning module to deliver cognitive behavior therapy program. So they learn about their disease and, and can, can walk through that and get that information in the palm of their hands at home. Um, you can also use it in clinical trial setting where you're basically teaching either a caregiver or a patient how to do something. Um, or you can teach a clinical trial coordinator how to do something. Um, and also, an, a recent application that we're using it for is you know, companies are so used to logging into their learning management systems, mm -hmm. which again, archaic, a little bit old, right? You, you navigate, you have to find your video, you have to, you know, so picture this, you do your training, and then six months later, now you need to do your job. Now you have to remember how to do that. Wait a minute, I have to go back, log into the system, find that training, wow. and do it. Whereas, how do people learn today? You go on YouTube, you yep. find the video, you watch it, and okay, I know how to do my job, so why can't we do that with pharma and biotech for their compliance and SOP type of training? So that's the third key area for us. So my son, my 10-year-old, has seizures. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I discovered a year or two back a, an app that would basically only take pictures of him and it could discern whether he was rolling over in bed, this only happens in bed, or mm -hmm. whether he was having a seizure. Mm -hmm. So amazing, and I can absolutely see where you talk about the different muscle muscle disorders. Yes. I can see ab absolutely yeah. where it would be beneficial to have a picture taken. Yeah. So yeah. Um, tell us a little bit more about the, the, current, uh, the current app, if you would. What's, what are, uh, current applications of the mobile platform right now. Can you expand on that? Some? Sure, so I mean, I can talk a little bit about, uh, uh, we do have a, an application for muscular disorders. Mm -hmm. um, we have, which I can't talk too much about because right. it is with a, with a biotech company. Okay. Um, th we have another one for binge eating, okay. which I've mentioned that's in the real world evidence space and that is available for download and open. Where would you see, where would you like to see this go if you look out look out in sure the so kind of our future uh, yeah. our future place so um, are really looking to expand into the analytics and the um, data you were saying yeah the yeah. data exactly so really mining the data okay. and coming out with insights okay if you think about today and how it works if 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 someone's not feeling well your son mm -hmm. the example you just gave right mm -hmm. you have to wait and see that physician clinician right and what's happening in between and, and how do you get that data and give it to your physician so right. he can uh, really understand what's happening in between visits. So our goal is to be able to collect the information through the iTake control platform, provide that means and that mechanism of gathering that information. And then the longer term is really being able to mine that data for the insights and being able to hopefully make a change and an impact in a certain disease population. It's great and maybe that will also help because there's video, let's say, that may also help providers to know who should be at the front of the line and, you know, this person sort of crying wolf and who knows? Yeah, absolutely. Knows? I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. The, the data is <coughs> not just for the patient. I mean, it's good to, to give something back to the patient about their own disease, but it's also for the provider. It's right. for the payer. I mean, the payers who are in, involved in the healthcare ecosystem need to know whether the drug is working or That's it's right. not working or what's making this patient worse or, or getting better. So it's, the data is really to serve all the key stakeholders of the, of the ecosystem. Thank you. Um, Dolly, you touched on some of this with Charlie's previous question, but w what are some of the, the issues in the current healthcare delivery system that could be enhanced or improved with the use of a mobile app like, like I Take Control? Um, I mean, you can talk a little bit about maybe, um, well, you did touch on provider and patient patient convenience and maybe the improvement of outcomes. Sure. So, yeah, a little bit about that, right? Mm -hmm. When we think about how we operate every day, everyone's got their phone on them. Mm -hmm. Everyone has their phone on them. And people are not used to 
you, you were asking them to leave their their day life behind and step into a whole other world and go back to different systems. So from patient convenience perspective, there's a lot we can do with mobile, a lot. And that's the first thing we need to uh, take uh, on board with the mobile application is it's gotta be convenient for the patient. It's gotta be engaging for the patient. We have mm -hmm. to be able to, S you can provide someone with something, but they're not going to use it, right? And there's hundreds and thousands of mobile applications out there. Why are patients using some and not others? Um, w one of the metrics that we look at is adoption. Are patients taking this app? Uh, one, of, one of the, and I can't talk about the details of it, but are they using the app? And we have a 90% adoption rate, which is great. That's great. It is, it's, it's, it's a very high, high percentage for an adoption for a mobile oh. application. So these are the types of things that we look at, but patient convenience. And if you provide that to the, to the user, mm -hmm. they'll use it. And if there's something in it for them, they will use it. So it's giving them something in the palm of their hand, wherever they are, to be able to do that, as opposed to taking them over to a clinical trial site frequently. Give them something at home to be able to do that. Um, outcomes, we talk about outcomes, which is really kind of, I would say, the real true value of the mobile applications, right? It's looking at the disease at, or the disorders that patients are going through every day and that data and being able to mine that data to get value back. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked about, you know, a couple of examples earlier. If you can't get that data, you can't improve the outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, there are several examples where I've seen real world data come into play and they show you outcomes with real world data that you couldn't have gotten from a clinical trial. So, mm -hmm. did I have that addressed the question? Yeah, it did, absolutely, thank you. How are you currently being funded? So, when we first started uh, the business, we had two options. We could have gone out and did a whole kind of round of raising money. Yeah, you guys were known in the business, right? You had worked for some big companies. We, yep, so we had our reputations behind us, and we had a vision, um, but we didn't have the product. And so, you know, we could put our effort towards fundraising, or we could put our effort towards trying to get the product done. So we did a round of friends and family. Okay. And from that money, we knew how much we wanted. We got, we achieved that goal. And then it was a very tight <laughs> budget, <laughs> but we were able to put together a plan to get the platform put together so that we can go out and, and say, okay, how are we going to um, go to market with this platform now? It was We had to be very, very careful. Um, you can't make an error when you have friends and family money because right. the money is very small and unless we're gonna go back out and fundraise again, and we didn't wanna be in that cycle. So we were very, very careful, very conservative in the um, product that we put out there in okay. our platform. So how do you see changing that in the future, that model, funding model in the future? Will you need to change it from fr friends and family to get to the next level? Yeah, uh, um, so we the first round was friends and family. We're now uh, software as a service company. Okay. And the, we take the revenue that we get from our uh, licensing our, our platform to various biotech and pharma companies to fund okay. ourselves. So right now it's working great. Okay. Um, we have enough coming in from the licenses and these projects that we do with pharma and biotech to keep us going. We do have some free apps like the Binge Eating Disorder app mm -hmm. that we have out and it's, um, it's available for everybody free of use. So we fund those types of free apps through um, the revenue that we get from our uh, subscriptions. Great, okay. So what would you consider a successful outcome to I Take Control to be? Yeah, you know, it's, it's one thing to grow a company, but our passion is really, and we started this because we really truly wanna make a difference for patients. So for us, a successful outcome is actually being able to make a difference for patients, for the healthcare ecosystem in general, being able to provide either pharma or the payer some insightful information to help guide that. Mm -hmm. um, we wanna be a player, a key player in this moving forward. Okay. Yeah. Great. So. Um, Dahlia, when we first met, um, you mentioned licensing, I'm going to read this so I don't yeah. mess it up, cognitive behavior therapy copyright content from Drexel University for use with your binge eating mobile app. Mm -hmm. uh, and that sort of led to a discussion about the, um, the richness of technology and innovation that's available at universities like Drexel and, and like other universities in the area. And I was wondering if you could you know, expand on that a little bit for our viewers about mm -hmm. of the importance of tapping in to that rich 
you know, base of knowledge at universities? Sure. <coughs> So I'm a true believer that there's a ton of innovation in uh, the academic institutions, and it's how we get it out. How do we get it out to actually be able to leverage it? Um, Drexel Ventures is a it's it's a little bit different than your traditional tech transfer, where you're going in and looking for certain IP and just saying, okay, that's what I want. If you come to an academic institution and say, here's an unmet need that I have. How do I fill that need and have that conversation with, I would say, the researchers, the innovators from the academic institution? You can come out with something great. Um, and we, you know, we we had similar conversations when we went out and tr got the uh, content for the Binge app that we currently have. So I, th I would say it's it's a great place to go. How you navigate and how you work to get that information and get the innovation out of it is something that um, companies need to think about carefully. So you, you really went down to another level. And you're saying yeah. instead, of like, instead of just walking in like you're walking into a supermarket or some sort of retail store and saying, oh, this is what you have. You have yeah. a patent on this. Yeah. Oh, that doesn't really work for me and that's it. You actually went directly to the university and said, this is what we're looking for. Can you help us get there? Yes. Real collaboration. Yeah, it was real collaboration, exactly. Yeah. And it was we started with the unmet need. What's the unmet need and let's fill that need versus let's see what you have and how can that fill the unmet need. Mm -hmm. So exactly right. Okay. Um, I did want to ask you, um, you know, this is we always try to include something about either the region or something to educate, you know, people who might be watching the show who are interested in doing something like you did with, with um, I take control. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to someone who's aspiring to run a health IT company but who's never done it before? Yeah, okay, good question. <laughs> um, in my 20 years of experience since I left graduate school or during even during my graduate school till today, I've learned a lot. Uh, and I know what I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you have to know what you don't know as well and build a team around you to do that. It's not just about the product. So I would say to anybody looking to start a company, it's not just about the product. The product is part of it, but the company is the rest of it. Knowing your competition, knowing how you're going to fund yourself and build that infrastructure before you even get off the ground is important. Uh, there are people who start companies that run out of money. Where are they going next? Are they going to go back out and raise more money? Or, or what, what happens to their timeline then? What happens to their plan? So 10 or 15 seconds, maybe we're, we're near the end. OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's the advice I would say. It's basically just get a, get a proper team together um, and be able to think holistically about the infrastructure okay. of the company. That's great. Well, thank you. This was terrific. Um, I want to thank you, Dolly, for being our special guest this, this evening. Must really much appreciated. Uh, Charlie, thank you for co-hosting. Sure, Kevin. Um, next on uh, uh, Money Matters uh, is uh, Stephen Shork, who's the founder and editor of the Shork Report, which is a daily newsletter for the energy markets. Uh, Money Matters is now available as an audible podcast on iTunes and Stitcher Radio, listed as Money Matters, the podcast for mobile devices. The video is available on our YouTube channel as well as on our website. Thanks for listening this evening, and we'll see you again next time.